Well, good morning to everybody. If you don't, if this is your first time here or your first time in a long time, my name is Mark. I get to be one of the associate pastors here at Life Church, and man, we've been we've been super blessed the last three weeks. We've had some amazing guest speakers, and uh, if you missed any of those, you didn't have a chance to listen to those. Make sure you go back and check those out on our YouTube because um, they are fire, they are powerful. And I am here because our list of guest speakers ran out. <laughs> so here, we, I'm just playing. <laughs> Any chance I can be up here and be able to bring the word, I'm super excited. And this is, one of the, this is one of the best parts of the job, is to be able to come up here and preach the word to you this morning. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Climbing the mountain, right, Josephine? Climbing the mountain, amen. That was the word before church today. Um, I actually took this message. This is a message that I actually delivered three years ago. And then God decided this morning that he's going to change it a little. By change, I mean revamp. So he pulled a Pastor Tim on me. I thought that was just you, man. But hey, he does that to everybody now, I guess. So, I mean, this is, so I'm going to be saying some of this stuff for the very first time, too. So I'm going to be as shocked as you are when some of the things that come out of my mouth happen. Um, and I really, the thing that I want to talk about today, you see it up on the screen. We want to talk about stirring up the truth. And we live in a day and age where truth is kind of taking a back seat to opinion. Where truth has taken a back seat to my, my feelings. And just because I feel a certain way and just because I think a certain way doesn't mean that I'm correct. Because, let's pray, we're done. Thank you, 2022. That's a good word, right? Because there's a difference today, but there's two types of truth. We have absolute truth and we have relative truth. Now, if we want to just break it down in the most simplest form, because that's where my brain has to go. Absolute truth is the truth absolutely. Like there's no denying. This is the absolute truth. Relative truth is, it's relative to you. It's like, and we, maybe we've heard the phrase before, well, that's just your truth. Or that's just what you think. Maybe, the God thing is just isn't for me. Have you tried him? Taste and see that the Lord is good, my friends. Get a taste and you're going to want the buffet. And I like buffets. <laughs> Amen. Because here at Life Church, we believe that we are people, we don't believe, we declare that we are people of the word. We are people of the word. We believe that God's word is our source of absolute truth. There is no wavering in that. We can't pick and choose the things in scripture that we want to live by and decide we want to live by and not live by all of it. We can't just pick and choose. Like, let me see. Uh, what do you have to say to me, God? That's weird. And sometimes it's not what you need to hear. It's probably what you should hear. But that's not the way that we look at Scripture. We want to look at Scripture by stirring up the truth that is there. And then that becomes resonant in our lives. And evidence of what God is doing in and through each one of us. So the main text I want to look at today is John 8, 32. He says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. That's a big if right there, isn't it? That's probably one of the biggest ifs in the whole of scripture. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you. Oh, y'all said that like captives. (laughs) The truth will set you. Amen. Amen. There is freedom found within the pages of Scripture. See, truth involves knowing and experiencing reality. And our our reality as believers is Jesus. That is our reality. And Jesus tells us to his disciples that you will come to know the truth by personal experience. That these guys walked with Jesus every day in the flesh. And they still messed up. I feel pretty good about myself then. 
Like they saw everything. And I'm like, I'm, t- I'm thinking about when even Je- when, when Jesus went up, when he left the earth, after he had been resurrected, he went up and then some people rejoiced and, then, and some people still didn't believe. He's rising up to the sky. I don't know about that. I need more. Do you? <laughs> Get out your feelings. See, for our lives, maybe, maybe you've been going to church a long time. Maybe you went to Sunday school. Maybe you've just been involved in Christian things for a long time. And we're fed this steady diet of truth. But what happens when you keep on filling and keep on filling and keep on filling and then you do nothing with it? You become spiritually swollen. You're going to read between the lines. You know what I'm saying? But see, if I'm in a steady diet of junk food and unhealthy choices in my life, and I don't look like Dwayne the Rock Johnson? Duh. Boy puts in work. You got to put in work to look like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. That's, that's the body I put in for when we get to heaven, by the way. It's like a combination of the Rock and Ryan Reynolds. If I could like find the, the whatever. So I put in my order. So if we're going to have this steady diet of truth in our lives, we have to be active on it. We have to exercise it. We have to exercise our faith. Because here's the thing. If we know Jesus, we have a relationship with him, and we have that truth within our lives, and yet we don't tell anybody else about it, it's like having the cure to cancer but not telling anybody. It's like having the cure to all the world's problems and keeping it a secret. Newsflash. You have the cure for everything that ails the world today. It's there. But I don't want people to know that I'm really, really a Christian. What if they think bad of me? Look at Jesus. The people that should have loved him and embraced him killed him. And the people that should have been the derelict and the outcast and the people that should have not even been in his presence were the ones that he embraced. See, it's not so much that what we know about God is whether we know him. And there's a huge difference. So today, I want to look at three things, three ways to stir up the truth in your life. You guys ready? Six of you. Sweet. The rest of you still don't know what you think about me. That's totally cool. I'm animated. I like to move. Here we go. So the first thing we want to look at is that if I want to stir up the truth in my life, I need to destroy the lies. I need to get rid of them. Not just like, oh, I'll just keep you here for later. No, don't keep them for later. They don't belong. You see, things happen in our lives that maybe sometimes we've let have the reins in our life. We've let it steer our direction of where we're going. So why do we always, do we sometimes sit with a truth not stirred up? Why do we sit with that truth not activated in our lives? I think sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. Having the truth stirred up in our lives sometimes makes us uncomfortable. Isaiah 30, chapter 10 and 11 says this. They tell the seers, stop seeing visions. They tell the prophets, don't tell us what is right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. Forget all this gloom. Get off your narrow path. Stop telling about your Holy One of Israel. What? What? See, sometimes we only want to hear the good news. We don't want to hear the hard stuff. If you want to see the good news, look at everybody's Facebook page and Instagram and whatever, and you get the best parts of people. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get 
the worst. And those are the people that we need to reach out to. We need to be a part of. But if people are going through good times, celebrate them. But remember, opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one. You don't need to show it off. Okay? I'm just saying. Why else does the truth go unstirred up in our lives? We deny it, hoping we, it'll go away. If I pretend the Bible isn't on my nightstand, I mean, it holds my coffee cup. It's a good, thick coaster, y'all. It won't wreck the wood on your table. It's fantastic. But we have to use that and stir it up within us. You see, in Jeremiah chapter 6, Jeremiah's warnings were given to the children of Israel and how they responded. They really liked the predictions of peace, but not his condemnation of their sin. Jeremiah hoped the fire of his prophetic message would purge the impurities of Judah like the refiner's fire pur pur uh, purges metal ore. Like you refine, fire, refine metals in a fire, it becomes so pure that the metal is transparent. So God is doing something that creates this transparency in our life. And we're like, okay. And he exposes things. But it also removes the impurities. But we got to let him remove the impurities. See, what, what eventually happened is that it only demonstrated that the people of Judah were totally corrupt. Because they didn't want to listen. We like our ways. We like our things. Because, see, the peace that they were looking for was the peace from war. But, which is a concept far from the Old Testament shalom peace that God was offering. He was offering them the peace of their soul, peace of their heart. Also, there's also a danger that comes when you're dealing with pain, when you're dealing with lies, when you're dealing with these things in our life. There also becomes this, when we're, sometimes we just keep the pain. Sometimes we just let the pain kind of, shape our identity in our own mind. But as weird as this may sound, sometimes pain makes us feel good. And you're like, that's messed up. Because see, if somebody has wronged us, if somebody has spread lies about us, if somebody has done something to us, it's really, really easy to stay bitter. There is no work involved in being offended. I just let my feelings get the best of me. Freedom takes the work. Freedom takes the effort. Because, see, I hold on to the pain because when I hold on to it, that means I can hold it against you. I can make myself feel better because I got something on you. So it elevates my self-worth in my own feeble brain. And I picture that as healthy. That is not healthy. And when we hold on to the pain and the lies, it becomes comfort for my resentment. Did you hear that? The pain becomes my comfort that feeds my resentment. So what do we do with that? We got to destroy the lies. We got to destroy the lies. And when we let go of the pain, we have nothing else to hold on to but Jesus. That's what we hold on to. We may feel that we don't want to be set free, with our, set someone else free with our forgiveness. But forgiveness will always be more powerful than bitterness. See, if when you forgive somebody else, it doesn't only set them free, but it sets you free as well. Because forgiveness will break chains in your heart and in your life. That bitterness just doesn't like that at all. Because it wants to hold you down. I believe that's one of the biggest strongholds that the devil has today. 
is that we go through with the stuff that we face, and then for some kind of distorted way, that becomes our identity. Jesus came that we have life and life more abundantly. The enemy's plan was to come and steal, kill, and destroy. Newsflash, I read the end of the book. We win. It's cool. All right? But until then, we were on a journey. We've got journey. We've got work to do. So here's what we need to do. We need to flip the script on our lies. We need to flip the script, and this is what I mean. Bear with me, because this may be weird. Here we go. Thank God for your pain. Thank God for this moment. Teach me something, God, in this. I don't like it. I don't like what I'm going through. But I know you can do something through it. Remember, there is a creator that loves you. You are the masterpiece of his creation. We need to start seeing ourselves through his eyes, not our own. And not how other people perceive us. I need to embrace how God the Father sees me. Because that's, that's a win. That's a win. So we have to stop worrying about what other people think. Instead of seeing these lies and, the, and that stuff as a roadblock, see it as an opportunity for breakthrough. God can break through all those things. We just have to let them. See, denying the truth doesn't change it. The truth remains constant, right? The world may change all around us, but the truth stands. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Doesn't waver. The good news is always the good news. It doesn't shift. Sin is never removed by denying it exists. But when Jesus shows up, we confess, he forgives, and then he opens our eyes to his truth, to his reality, to how he sees us. But it takes work. It is a journey to destroy the lies. Because I believe a lot of us are, have been dealing with lies and things said over our lives for most of our lives. And it's time for those chains to be broken. It's time to be set free. And we could try to do it in our own strength in the best self-help book in the world. It's, it's okay. It's the Bible. I don't care what anybody else comes out with. If we ground ourselves in the word of God, best self-help book ever. So how do we deactivate the lies? You may have heard this verse before. It's Proverbs 18.21. Do you know this one? We've only been saying this for, what, a decade-ish? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. Not only what you speak over everybody else, but what you speak over yourself. Because a lot of time, the most powerful thing that's spoken over us is the things that we speak over ourselves. We become, what was me? We become self-deprecating. We become... Oh, I'm not good enough to do that. Which is actually, when you boil it, boil it down, is pride. Yeah. Scary. I'm just saying, I'm reading some of this for the first time. so We're on this together. Take the lies and kick them out because they got no place there. And for some of you, they've been sitting around way too long. And it's time to go. Because we got work to do. So how do we do this? Well, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all of he has done for you. Let them be a holy and living sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. 
You see, this transforming and renewing of our mind is a daily thing. It doesn't just happen on Sunday. I'm like, sweet, I'm good for the rest of 2022. Well, if we've learned anything over the last two years, that's not true. There is a constant bombardment to us and on us. So it's important that we constantly renew and transform our minds. Don't be patterned to the things of what the world, let the world do, the world's going to do what the world's going to do. We've been set apart. But we have been called to reach a world. And we can't reach a world with truth if we don't know what the truth is. We got to know what we represent, right? I'm going to do something right now that I have never done ever in a sermon. I'm going to read you a book. Well, other than the Bible. <laughs> Caveat. But I'm going to read you a children's book. And I want you to listen. Because although it's a children's book, I may or may not cry, so hold tight. Don't judge me. If it's not a Hallmark commercial, it's a good book, okay? Some of you may know this book. It's called You Are Special by Max Locato. And I want you to listen closely because I believe this is actually, this is for everyone. It's a kid's book, but I think I've seen more adults impacted with this than kids. You're welcome. Now it's a book, so don't be like, that's not in scripture. It's okay. Listen to the parallel. <laughs> There's symbolism. Work with me. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes, some were tall, others were short. Some wore hats and others wore coats. But all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of Golden Star stickers and a box of Gray Dot stickers. Up and down the streets, all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on each other. The pretty ones, those with the smooth, fine, smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint was chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones got stars, too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else and get another star. Others, though, could do little. They got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood, got his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. And when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and then the Wemmicks just gave him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step in the water. And then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would just come up to him and give him a dot for no reason at all. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he said. A few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks and had lots of dots. He felt better around them. One day, he, one day he met a Wemmick, unlike he had ever met before. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. 
It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers wouldn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admire Lucia for having no dots. So they would run up and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others would look down on her for having no star, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stick either. That's the way I want to see, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I, sat, I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Well, why don't you go find out for yourself? Go up the hill. He's there. And with that, the Wemmick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Lucia didn't hear. So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other uh, stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself. So he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. Then he heard his name. Punchinello? The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. Do you know my name, he said. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and sat him on the bench. Hmm. The maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what the other Wemmicks think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give you stars or dots? They're Wemmicks, just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me? Special? Why? I can't walk. I can't jump. My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on the small wooden shoulders, and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter. Punchinello never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know. She told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks, but for now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said to him as he walked out the door, you are special because I made you, and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground.
Thanks, kids' books. I thought about this book. A lady had shared it at our school in chapel on Thursday, and it just hit me. And I'm like, adults need to hear this book. You may have stars on you today, and you may have gray dots, but it doesn't matter because that's how a flawed world has pictured you, but your perfect father, your good, good father sees you as flawless. He sees you as perfect. He sees you as beautiful. He sees you as a masterpiece, and he loves you so much, and on the flip side of that, Maybe you've given stars and dots. Maybe, maybe we're the Wemex, and we'll do what we can to make somebody else feel bad so we can feel better. And I pray God would just break our hearts and would allow us just to see one another for who we are, God's amazing creation, that he's created you with a purpose and a reason I cry a lot, so it's okay. It's a powerful book. I probably just could end the sermon right there. (laughs) So destroy the lies. Destroy them. And if you don't know what that looks like, talk to somebody. Surround yourself with a community. You're not in this alone. Find somebody to chat with, talk to, to pray with. We'll have that opportunity after church, after service today. But don't leave here today carrying your stars and your stickers and your dots. Because God wants to make those things fall to the ground and let you see how he sees you. And you're beautiful. That point took way longer than I thought it would. So we're going to fly. You ready? What's that? Worth every day. Amen. Amen. All right. Are we ready to roll? Here we go. Point number two. Another way that we can stir up the truth in our lives is to dive into the word. When we dive into the world, we find out our identity. We found out who we are. Why is the, why is the word of God so important for, for turning up the truth, for stirring it up? Because it's the truth. It's the truth. Here's what it does. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. It teaches us right from wrong. See, Jesus isn't interested in allowing our issues to go unchecked. If there's something going on in our lives, guess what? He is very, very, very interested in all those things. And he is all in the business of setting you free. So we have to let him take the control. Oh, but we like being corrected, don't we? (laughs) I do. Sorry, I just lied. My bad. (laughs) No, we don't like that. But it's, it's part of the journey. It's part of the process. It's part of what God wants to do in our hearts is that some things may need to be tweaked in our life. We may need to adjust things maybe in a schedule, maybe to adjust something in our heart, a priority, a relationship. Some things may need to be adjusted or in order to let him in. Because if our life is so full and we don't make room for Jesus, then it's just a life, not a life more abundantly.
Proverbs 4, 20 to 22 says, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. I love that. Pay attention and listen carefully. That's not a natural action for us as humans. Pay attention and listen carefully. What? What did they say just now? I'm a teacher. I know how that is. <laughs> the struggle is real. You give all the instructions and the hand goes up and you know who the student is and you're like, yes. I think I got it, but could you start again from the beginning because I think I wasn't listening. I'm like, buddy, were you listening to me? Uh-huh. Talk to him. I don't got time for take two. I got to move on. Unless I'm crying over a kid's book, then I got to take moments. See, don't lose sight of what God is saying to you. Don't lose sight of it. Let it penetrate. I love that word. Let it penetrate your heart. Let it find a home and let it just mm, make itself at home in there. It's amazing what it does. See, God's word brings healing to the whole body. Physical, spiritual, mental. His word can bring healing to all of those things. And this is why we need to know what we believe. 1 Peter 3.15 says, and I, I don't, this one, I think this was a curveball, so sorry. This was a late addition. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why do I need to know the truth? Because if somebody asks me what I believe and why do I believe, I got to be ready to give them an answer. We can't just go, because. And here's the thing. Don't be afraid of the words, I don't know. I teach a Bible class. Eighth grade. They have questions. <laughs> Homie's got to do some homework sometimes. Because I'm like, okay, what's your question? Blah, 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 blah. Holy moly. <laughs> I'm going to go to the Lord first, and then I'm going to do some research. Because I'm like, good question. Get out. <laughs> no, because if they're inquiring about it, it's something that their heart is wanting to know. So if I don't know the answer, I got to do some homework. Because if I don't, they're just going to wonder. Because let's be real. They're probably not going to go find out for themselves. The little world dictate to them what they think. So if we have an opportunity to inject truth into their hearts and in their lives, then we take it. Even if it means, I don't know, I'll tell you tomorrow. And go home and do it. It's like when you tell somebody, I'll be praying for you. And you don't. And then the next time you see them, oh, Lord, please help their situation. Amen. I've been praying for you. I mean, it was real spur of the moment, but I was just now. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> Write that stuff down. These little things are more useful than for cat videos. Cat videos, who does that? I used to. Here's why it's important to know what we believe. I grew up, for about seven years I sold cars. And it was very, very important for me to know my product and know what my product did and what the, all the specifications and all that. It was also very important to know what my competitor had. The kids today, and us today as humans, we have the opportunity to know the truth. But we are also bombarded by a competitor that does not want us to know the truth. So we gotta know our product. We gotta know what we believe. It's important because as many people in the world today that want to say, I don't believe that, I don't trust that, I don't believe there's a God, hmm. 
And then you have a conversation with them and they completely break down and, they, they, and you find out that I hate God because this happened in my life and this became something and I was mad and I was upset and really, and then they start to break the chains. People are starving and they're crying out for truth. Even in their physical bodies, they are saying, I don't want it. But deep inside their heart and their souls, they're saying, I need it. So we need to be the providers, right? Mark 24, wow, Mark 4, 24 and 25 said, pay a close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given. And you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teachings, more understanding will be given. For those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. See, Jesus is appealing for our spiritual perception. He wants to give us more. We just got to be ready for more. If we're not ready for it, guess what? We're not ready. Who can know the Lord's thoughts? 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who can knows the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. When we have the mind of Christ, that comes from that back in Romans 12, where it talks about that constantly renewing and transforming of the mind. When we renew and transform our mind on a daily basis, that is when we get the mind of Christ. We start to think like he thinks, and oh, it's amazing. It shifts your perspective. Because now I get to see a society, I get to see a world through Jesus' eyes and not my flawed lenses. And I got bifocals now, so it is jacked up. I got to watch where I'm looking or else I trip. That's a good word, no matter what. (laughs) Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. That verse could have stopped right there. But it's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. What that means is that it can go in and precisely cut out the things out of our lives that don't need to be there. And then he fills it with his presence and his joy and his love and his peace and his mercy and his grace. The stuff that doesn't end. It's new every morning. There is no end to it. So don't think like you're being a burden. God's saying, bring it on. I've been waiting for you to bring it for a decade. Bring it. And I'm going to skyrocket through third point. Are you ready? Because I think this is important too. The last thing, dig into fellowship. Dig into fellowship. How can I stir up the truth in my life? Surround yourself with people that want to know the truth. Surround yourself with like-minded people. Surround yourself with people that they're going where you're going. If you have that friend that's kind of like the naysayer, that's like, well, yeah, you know that person. A simple kick action. Because you don't need that. But it's an opportunity to reach them through your actions and through your words and through your love. Don't give up. Just don't let them infect you. Why do I use the word dig? Because relationships take work. Husbands and wives, if the, if the only I do that has ever happened in your life was on your wedding day. Husbands, you know. I do a lot. <laughs> but that's why we're, that's, we're partners. We work it out together. It's a teamwork. But it's the same way that the body of Christ is. We're a family. The capital C church needs to be wor- working together. Not being separated over... Find, you know, silly issues. I'm not going to go over it. <sighs> Gentlemen, when you met your wives or your significant others, was that the end of the journey? When I proposed to my wife, it would be like, oh, sweet, made it. Totally nailed it. Smooth sailing. I am the man. No, I got work to do. That's... I mean, you know, kudos for me that I got that far by God's grace. 
But that's the beginning of the journey. Just like when we accept Jesus into our heart, when we accept him into our lives, that's not it. Sure, we've got fire insurance now. But it needs to go deeper. There's an old saying that Jesus will take you just the way way you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you that way. Transforming and renewing of the mind. It's a journey. So surround yourself with like-minded people. I think I've shared this with you before. I had a piano teacher, and she had this thing on her fridge. And it said it's hard to soar like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys. That's a good word, because my neighbors got turkeys. No, I'm serious. Across the street from me, they have turkeys. And one of them suckers was eyeing me up one time. He, like, he came across the street. All, he jumped their fence, and he came at me with his, fle- his feathers all up like we were about to throw down. So I'm like, don't you come at me Thanksgiving. Don't you come at me. My daughter was helping me do yard work. I said, Jordan, go inside because this boy looks psycho. <laughs> Turkeys are crazy. They've been gone for a minute, so I'm assuming they were delicious. <laughs> but now they have little ones. So I'm like, oh, round two. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't sur- if you want to soar like an eagle, don't surround yourself with people that want to pluck your wings. And as I said that, you thought of someone. Because I did. Pray for that person. But also, don't allow that to be an influence in your life. Jesus is a way better influence. Invest in that. Because we'll invest a lot of time into toxic relationships. And that's not where we should be putting our time. If you hang out with someone and when you go home and at the end of the day, you're like, I'm not sure if I enjoyed that or not. Red flag. Maybe, maybe don't worry about that. Surround yourself with like-minded people. I'm going to leave you with this, these verses. And then I'm going to give you some homework, okay? You're welcome. Second Timothy 2.22 says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call, the Lord with, call on the Lord with pure hearts. Call, hang out with people. Speak life to one another. In the last section, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of yourselves, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't flip that. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. If Jesus wanted... (laughs) This is where my brain goes. Man, if I was Jesus... I would have pulled them nails down, jumped off the cross, and laid the smack down. I told you. That's me. Because me and my daughter watch wrestling. So bad parallel. But he comes and he did it and he sacrificed himself so that we could be set free. See, he did not take his godhood as, as, a, as a bargaining chip with people. He came as 100% God, 100% man, all obedience. And he did his father's work. So here's your homework this week. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Number one, 
engage in a daily Bible reading habit. And I've heard some people say a daily habit, a daily, daily reading practice. People must practice all the time. But a habit is something that sticks. So make sure it's something, and remember, this is not something that you have to do. It's something that we get to do. There's life and there's joy that comes from spending time on God's word. Number two, commit to declaring God's word in response to any lie and replace the bitterness with forgiveness. So this week, spend some time with the Lord and let your stickers drop to the floor. And if you've laid stickers on people, get a hold of those people and ask for their forgiveness. Because it sets you free too. And the last thing, are you ready? Have a conversation with someone new starting today. But be intentional about it this week. Because everything bends around relationships. Everything. And it doesn't matter if it's a 10-minute conversation. Just maybe you see somebody in this room today that you don't know. Go say hi. Never underestimate the power of hello. Hello will break down a wall. Because I've seen it happen. And I think you probably have too. Can I pray for us this morning? God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, God, for how you speak. I thank you, God, for your truth, for your rock-solid truth that transcends all time, all attitudes, all opinions, that your truth remains solid. Father, allow us to be people of truth. Stir it up within our hearts, Father, to spend more and more time with you, to spend time on your word, to surround ourselves with people, championing one each other on, stirring each other up to love and good works. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for my friends that are here, for those who are watching online. I pray that you would allow anything that has been said over them. I break those things in Jesus' name. Any stickers that have been laid upon their skin, upon their body, upon their soul, upon their heart, upon their mind, we break those things off in Jesus' name. Because they have no authority here, nor do they have any authority because we are children of the Most High God. So we break off these things. Jesus, we stand with you. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.